what that's good fam happy wednesday everybody i hope you're having a great week but per usual it's about to get a lot better because we have an incredible guest on the podcast today that i myself have personally learned from from his books um, his studies online and i cannot wait to dive into his new book practicing the way we have john mark comer on the podcast welcome to the what that's good podcast Hey, hey, great to be with you, Sadie. Thanks for having me on. Yes, this is going to be awesome. Um, My husband was texting me just a second. He was like, are you so excited for the podcast? I was like, I am. I feel like I have so much to learn. And so hopefully everyone's logging in today uh, with the same excitement. But if people don't know who you are, if they haven't read the books, tell us a little bit about your life, what you do, all the things. Yes, my name is John Mark Comer. I um, have written a number of books, one that... Uh, some people may know about. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, but I am from the West Coast, born and raised in California, but spent the last 20 years church planting and pastoring with Bridgetown Church in Portland, Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, and just a year or two ago, stepped down to start a nonprofit, also called Practicing the Way, and cool. relocated back to California, and I live in Topanga Canyon in LA. That's basically me. I'm That's working awesome. on discipleship stuff for people in post-Christian culture. That's awesome. So good and so helpful. Um, So I love that you titled that book Ruthless Elimination because that is kind of how it feels, Um, especially Mm -hmm. for me. I'm a very... I'm a hurried person. I, I can't lie. You know, I think we all yeah, that, that was here. why that book hit so hard is that we all saw that title and are like, oh, man, that's my life. And just <laughs> the fact that it has to be an aggressive <laughs> elimination because it's hard to do. Um, so yeah. it's funny that you even said same here. So you didn't write that book because you like had it all figured out. You came from living a Heck hurried lifestyle, no. right? OK, tell us a little bit about yes. the writing of that book, because I know a lot of people are familiar it sounds with it. Like- we would share a bit of a similar psychosis. Yes. Yep. Type A driven. Probably, I was thinking it's, as we're recording this, it's Christmas time. And I have lovely memories of Christmas shopping with my dad back in the day when you had to like go to a mall or a store to Christmas shop mm-hmm. and not your laptop. <laughs> yep. And I remember walking around the mall. We used to always, it was part of our tradition where we would go, we'd save something to buy on Christmas Eve because we loved, my dad loved to go to the mall on Christmas Eve where it was just like jam packed and it was like right out of like a Home Alone movie or something (laughs) and buy. So we would always at least save one last item for Christmas Eve. And I remember walking around the mall with my dad and we would pride ourselves on being the fastest walkers in the whole mall and just passing person after these suckers just going slow through life. So very much, no, type A driven, uh, to quote a mentor who said to me a few days ago, I feel oppressed by hurry. And uh, yeah, there's a much longer conversation, but hit a wall in my own discipleship to Jesus and formation into a person of love where I just could not get past a few systemic issues in my character, like anxiety, perfectionism controlling behavior toward my kids, obsessive, compulsive, neat freak, house cleaning and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And um, discovered that same mentor actually was himself mentored by the philosopher Dallas Willard, who has played a key role in my life, who was a Christian um, and a philosopher. And he uh, once went to Dallas and basically said, hey man, I'm not doing well. I'm not you know, I'm really struggling emotionally and in my own formation into a person of love. What do I need to do? And uh, Willard said to him, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. Hmm. And then he said, hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. Wow. Which there's so many interesting things about that. One that he named hurry as the great enemy, not secularism, not political polarization, not ideological idolatry, not what you fill in the blank. Hurry was what he identified as the number one challenge for Christians in the modern West. Wow. And secondly, he identified it as an enemy. Not So it's not neutral. Hurry is actually like against you. It has an active campaign to sabotage your life and formation into a person of love. Therefore, our response to hurry can't be neutral either. It has, we have to fight back if we have any desire 
to live a slower life at the pace of Jesus that is wow. more conducive to becoming a person of love. And, um, and that really is uh, that re I mean, there's a felt need we all have to be less stressed out and hurried, but mm. the angle I approach it through is just the angle of discipleship to Jesus, where the whole point is to become a person of love in God good. and hurry and love are incompatible. Um, wow. when I am in a hurry, I am not loving and gentle and patient mm. and kind, you know, and so I'm in, uh, Corinthians 13, the famous love poem that we hear at weddings all the time. The first descriptor of love is love is patient, hmm. which can also be translated from the Greek as love is unhurried. It's the wow. very first descriptor. Yeah. So um, whatever love is, it's unhurried presence to another person and kindness. Wow. And uh, I can't do that and be chronically overextended, exhausted and hurried all the time. Wow. So that's, that's so kind of how I come at it. That's so good. That's beautiful. I was just thinking about, um, I feel like I quote this sermon a lot on this podcast and maybe that's just saying how much it meant to me, but, uh, Ben Stewart preached a sermon at passion last year. I think it was the Dallas. Yeah, it was Dallas passion. And he was talking about how as a generation, we have lost our ability to be in awe. And it was hmm. essentially talking about how, you know, to be in awe, you would have to be captivated. You would have to be still, you would have to be unhurried to really yes. be in awe of what's before you. And because we're so distracted because, um, we have our phones before us. It's constantly distracting us. It's begging for our attention. Or even on social media, you scroll so fast. Mm -hmm. You're not even stopping to yes. really take it in. It's like happening so fast that we just are not, no longer in awe. And I was thinking about this because um, I had my second daughter back in May. And, um, congratulations. Really, thank you. It's the best thing ever, but she, and she's just amazing. What's her name? Her name is Haven. So I have a little Haven oh, lovely and name. my uh, first daughter's name is Honey and they're the sweetest girls. But when I had Honey, I, um, did not slow down. Like I just was like, you know, kept going at the same speed I had been going at before. Didn't really take the time to even do a maternity leave. Just was like on mission going which mm. led me to like hitting a brick wall 100 miles wall. per hour yeah and it was like mm -hmm. it was the you know it was a dark season it's a hard time in my life um not because of honey but because of me being so hurried and just not yes. slowing down or taking the time I needed so when I had Haven I was like I'm going to like truly slow it down like truly take the maternity leave, no work, be at home with my kids and just be and soak in the season that it is. And it was so interesting, even the thoughts that I had that I noticed myself having, like um, every night, every single night was like my favorite. I wish I could bottle this up and just, I hope I remember it forever. But um, I would go outside with Honey and Christian and I would be holding Haven and Christian and Honey would be hitting the little t-ball. And it was just like the best time. And I remember just looking up one night and seeing this airplane because Honey is obsessed with airplanes. And every night she'd be like, airplane, airplane. But she calls them hair planes, which is just hilarious. <laughs> she'd be like, hair plane, hair plane. And um, I just got to thinking one night you know, as I'm looking at this in the sky, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, wow, there are like people in that plane. So like, you don't really think about that when you see an airplane, like there are people just sitting up there. That's crazy. And I was like, somebody made that and designed that for them to be able to do what they're doing. And then thinking about that, then I was like, man, I wonder if this is when it's talking about when it's talking about how like the heavens, like declares glory, like you could look up and you just have to start thinking who made that because right after the airplane passed, you birds pass. And it's like the same thought who made that God made that God created that. How beautiful, where are they going? Like I just had these thoughts that I don't think mm -hmm. about whenever I typically see an airplane or I see a bird or I see these things because I'm in a hurry. And all of a sudden, as I'm sitting there, I'm captivated by what's happening right before me. My awe begins to write. I'm like, wow, I'm in such awe of who created this. And this is so wonderful. And this is so beautiful. And Everyone in the world is seeing the sky right now and how crazy. And so anyways, I say that to say it is amazing when you are unhurried 
even what you notice that has always been there that you've seen before, but it didn't captivate you like it did before. And so I, I have definitely seen that in my life, like the enemy to that spiritual um, awareness yes. or even spiritual disciplines and all that, this being in a hurry can really steal from. Um, I love that even the first you know, your first answer you gave on this podcast, you quoted two people. Um, the whole model of this podcast, if you will, is I ask people what's the best piece of advice they've ever been given. And the reason mm. I ask people that question is because I have so many influential people come on, but I want to know like what influenced you? What was it that you heard that kind of began to shape your life? And you've already named a couple, so that might have been some of it. Um, and you named no, so I many that- quotes in this book, but what's some of the best piece of advice that you've ever been given that begin to shape you. As you know, the gospel of Jesus has changed my life forever. Literally, it's why I do everything that I do. I think we should all uh, be going and preaching the Bible. That doesn't mean you have to be a preacher. That doesn't mean you have to necessarily do vocational ministry. But if you are a follower of Christ, that means going and telling people about Him. And that is exactly what Crew is doing. That's why I'm so thankful to be partners with Crew. Crew has missionaries in nearly every country in the world. And they are seeing so many people come to know Jesus. But many of these new Christians are missing something very important, which is a Bible in their own language. For many of us, we can just head over to the nearest bookstore or literally order a Bible on Amazon and have it delivered super fast. But that's not the reality for many Christians and um, you know, all parts of the world. So friends, this is where we can help. For only $24 a month, you can provide three people with Bibles each and every month. When you sign up to provide three Bibles with a monthly gift of $24, as a thank you, Crew will provide meals to 12 hungry individuals through the humanitarian aid ministry. Plus, you'll receive a free copy of Christians in my new book, How to Put Love First. If you haven't heard of it, it's a 90-day devotional challenge about putting God first in your life. This is not just a relationship book. It's for everyone because everyone is in relationship with someone. And the way that we're going to make our relationships thrive is by having God first. Many of you have already signed up to give, and I just want to stop and say thank you so much for doing that. Y'all really are amazing, but there is still so much more to do, and Crew still needs your prayers and help to keep sharing the Word of God all over the world. So simply text GOOD to 71326 to help today. Just imagine how much this monthly gift could change someone's life. So text GOOD to 71326, that's G-O-O-D, to 71326 to help now or visit give.crew.org O-R-G slash GOOD. Message and data rates may apply, available to U.S. addresses only. Mm, I, I already said, that's it. I mean, that line, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life, which hilariously was not actually said to me. It was said I to a mentor that. of mine yeah. who then passed it on to me. It's great. And yeah, I mean, the first time uh, he said that to me, um, it was like, there's this thing. Do you know what a tuning fork is, Sadie? It's it's, it's a weird musician thing. I don't know. So, uh, it's, okay, there's this thing called a tuning fork that if you play a certain instrument, especially if you orchestral music or guitar, um, it's like this metal piece and you hit it and it vibrates at a certain frequency hmm. and uh, you can like tune your guitar to it or your instrument to it. And But it does this weird thing where when you hit it, it vibrates and you feel it like in your bones. It's There's huh. this like weird you know resonance at like in your bones with the frequency that it emits it's just it's hard to describe if you've never felt it it's a really it's like a one it's a once in a lifetime a feeling it's just like very unique hmm. and um it kind of felt when i first when he said those words to me you must ruthlessly eliminate her from your life her is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day it felt like a tuning fork kind of in my soul it felt like some deep thing in me hmm. just vibrated as it touched on a piece of reality in the universe. Hmm. And that was a number of years ago. And I have been honestly just trying to live that out ever since. And it turns out that is quite hard. (laughs) Yeah. Living an unhurried life with three kids and a full-time job and in a city and in the digital age uh, and the generativity and responsibility of adulthood It turns out that it is very hard to live a unhurried life. And so I think I am still very much in process. 
mm-hmm. and I have a long ways to go. But yeah, I would say that was, if I had to dial it down to one piece of advice, that's certainly the most impactful in the last decade of my life. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I would say so. It definitely has shaped a lot of what you've done and what you put out. And I would say that it's probably cool that a lot of people out there would even say that's the best piece of advice they've ever been given from reading your book. So very, very cool. Um, you have <laughs> a new book. Just passing on advice, right? And I left. love it. That's what we're doing. That's what well, that's good's all about. Um, you have this new book out, Practicing the Way, and it's so good. It's so, I have so many things I want to talk to you about. I was writing down thoughts and I was like, oh, man, this is just going to go by way too fast. But um, I just have to open the book because at the start of it, it's so cool. It actually reminds me a lot of my book, Who Are You Following? Not the whole book because it's Mm -hmm. way over my head and um, ability to write. However, it starts the same with the question, who are you following? And I wanted people to ask themselves that question because that's such an important question to ask yourself. Um, Then you go on to ask this question right after that question. The question is not, am I a disciple? It's who or what am I a disciple of? And I was like, that's it. Like you have to ask yourself that question. So can you just speak a little bit about why you chose that to be the first question of the book and why you wanted that to be on the forefront of people's minds? Yeah, I think as I write about in that opening chapter, there's this myth in American culture that basically says we're not following anybody. We're a true original and we're just living our life from scratch. And, uh, you know, Americans aspire to be leaders, not followers, you know, which is somewhat hilarious when you do the math on that. We can't all be leaders. And uh, we aspire to be leaders, not followers. We love to think that we're just kind of a blank slate that we project an identity onto and choose, you know, all the stuff on identity in particular that my generation and yours has been living through is all based on this kind of a myth that we make our own identity and we choose our own identity and we choose our own life path. And um, the reality is that I, I argue in the book that we're all following somebody or something. The question is, what and that very powerful forces from silicon valley and corporations that want to sell us shoes and clothes and subscriptions have a vested interest in us believing that we're not following anybody else's script we're just following the authentic desires of our heart to a true and happy life in order to keep us blind to all the ways that we are being discipled informed and manipulated and moved by their desires which are normally to get us to buy something or vote for someone or believe something or change our opinion about something. And this is just inevitable in human society. So for me, the the core question is not, am I going to follow Jesus? It's who or what am I going to follow? You know, um, I'm a big believer that religion is not a religious thing. You know, the best definition of religion is a system of meaning and belief about what life is all about, what is good, what is evil, how we become a good person, where do we belong, what's the meaning and purpose of life. And uh, by that definition, there are many religions that are religions, and then there are many ideologies. Work is a religion for a lot of people. Sexual identity is a religion for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Money is a religion for a lot of people. Fame and success are religion for a lot of people. Athletics is a religion for a lot of people. There are all sorts of different religious systems that people live by that give them a sense of identity, purpose, belonging, community, um, a telos for life. And I just think that Jesus is by far the most compelling of all of them. So I want people to think critically, even if they don't agree with me, about who or what am I following? What am I putting my trust in? I think about it this way, Sadie. Like, imagine you want to go on a road trip somewhere awesome, but there are no, like, maps there. You don't know how to get Mm -hmm. there. And you've never been there. You just hear this place is amazing, But in order to get there, you have to ask somebody for directions. Like just imagine that. It's hard to imagine a a pre-iPhone world. (laughs) And uh, that person's going to give you directions and you're going to follow that person's directions to this place that you think is amazing. 
Yeah. But if, um, if that person's directions are wrong or if that person is untrustworthy and they're actually trying to get you to like go to some seedy place where they can rob you or if they're just totally well <laughs> sincere and they totally want you to get there, but they, they don't understand, they're wrong about how to get there, then you are going to end up lost, which is the very yeah. word that Jesus used for people that are not followers of him. And it's a really yeah. honoring word. Lost doesn't say anything about your IQ or your moral capacities or the goodness of your heart. When I get lost, I don't feel shame. I just feel lost, <laughs> you know, like yeah. I don't know where I am or how to get where I need to go. Yeah. And uh, I think all of us have this destination we want to get to of a happy life, a flourishing life, whatever you want to call it, a good life. The question, the problem is none of us have actually been there. We're all trying to get somewhere we have not yet been. Hmm. And we need directions and yep. we need a map. To get there and it has to come from somebody who's been where we want to go and the question is um, is that person going to be Jesus or is it going to be our celebrity of choice or our intellectual mm -hmm. of choice or our politician of choice um, or historical figure of choice or is it going to be Jesus and I'm an advocate for Jesus it's great. It's so good. I love that so much. Yes, that is such a needed message. And I love like thinking about how Jesus this literally said, like, I am the way. I am the truth. Mm -hmm. I am the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. So it makes it so clear, you know, like yeah. I'm, I am the choice, you know, this is the best person to follow because I am actually the way. I'm the truth. I'm yeah. the, the life. And so I love that. So, so beautiful. Um, I thought this was very interesting in the book where you talk about the difference in being a Christian and an apprentice or a disciple. And it was mm. so interesting that there was only like, I think two or three times that you said that, you know, the word Christian is used in the Bible, but then there's like 200 plus of yeah, this barely other used word. in the Bible. Yes, yes, barely at all. And so talk a little bit about the difference of the two and what could shift in people's minds by going from just saying like, oh, I'm a Christian to truly being an apprentice of Jesus. Christian and I spent our first Christmas in our new house, and it was so amazing and so fun. And one of the best parts of our new house is, of course, our awesome Helix Sleep mattress. We love a good night's sleep because, y'all, to be honest, it's few and far between. Having a two-and-a-half-year-old and a, a seven-month-old, sleep is not always in the picture, but when we get it, we want it to be good, and our Helix mattress is the best. It's a premium mattress brand that provides mattresses that are tailored to you and your unique sleep preferences. Helix offers 20 unique mattresses including luxury kids and big and tall models. They have it all, y'all. And the Helix Elite Collection includes the most premium models yet with a built-in cooling cover, tons of supportive coils, and even extra lumbar support. That cooling thing is awesome, y'all, because we get so hot at night. Everyone is unique, and that includes our sleep habits. So Helix offers models for every sleep position and feel preference. Some models have memory foam layers, some have enhanced cooling features like I mentioned, and some come with extra responsive foam to give your spine the extra TLC that you need. But every Helix mattress is made with a hybrid design of foam layers and coils to give the perfect combo of comfort and support. With all these included options, how do you know what's gonna be the best for your body? Well, it's super easy. You're just gonna take the Helix Sleep Quiz and in under two minutes, Helix will hook you up with the perfect mattress for you and your sleep preferences. Then your mattress will ship straight to your door for free, which arguably is the best part of this whole thing. I love it when brands have confidence and Helix is so confident in their product that they're going to give you 100 nights to try it out, to try your Helix Sleep mattress in your own home. I took the Helix Sleep quiz and I was matched with the Helix Midnight mattress because I wanted something that wasn't too soft and not too firm. I also sleep on my side and so does Christian. So it was just the perfect mattress for both of us. We love it. Like I said, it has that cooling feature and we get really hot at night. He gets really hot and it makes me really hot. So it's nice to have that extra feature in there to um, we love it. We wake up feeling refreshed, and that is saying something, especially in the days that we're living in. But um, not only are Helix mattresses the best, but the setup is so fast and so easy. Like I said, it's maybe the best part of the whole thing. And of course, shipping is free, but you don't just have to take my word for it. Helix has been selected as the number one mattress by Wire Magazine and is even recommended by several leading chiropractors and sleep experts. All Helix mattresses are American-made and come with a 10- or 15-year warranty depending on the model that you choose. 
use, which is so awesome. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash Sadie and use their code HELIXPARTNER20. This is their best offer yet and it won't last long. With Helix, better sleep can start now. Go to helixsleep.com slash Sadie and use the code HELIXPARTNER20. Oh, yeah. I love that you're asking that question. Yeah. So uh, the word Christian is only used two or three times in the New Testament. Interestingly, it's never used the way we use it today, where followers of Jesus self-identified as Christians. It was actually used as like a religious slur. It was a, a an insult hmm. from the pagans, which was not a derogatory term in the New Testament era. People self-identified as pagans. Um, and it was the word Christian literally means like a little Christ or a, a mini Messiah. And it was almost like a slur way of saying like, Oh, you're a wannabe Jesus, or you wow. think you're, you know, you're a little, little Christ, mini Messiah, wannabe Jesus. And it was a, it was a mock. It was a joke. It was an insult. And years later, Christians who had been being called this kind of religious slur for many decades or longer, finally just like self-identified <laughs> and said, yes, that is who we are. We are many messiahs. We're a little Christ. We want to be like Jesus. We're not, but, and began to self-identify with this language. So there's nothing wrong with the language of a Christian, but that's not the language used by Jesus. He never used that word a single time. Christianity is not a word used anywhere in the whole Bible. He <laughs> invited people not to become Christians and certainly not to convert to Christianity. He invited people to follow him. He would say, come and follow me. Or another way to translate that is come and be my disciple or come an apprentice under me. Uh, the Greek word is mathetes, and it's normally translated disciple in English. But a lot of scholars think apprentice is actually an even better word to translate what this kind of word means. It was, it was a student, but not like in our system where like you go to class and then you go home. Mm -hmm. It was an apprentice, like an apprentice mm -hmm. to a plumber or an electrician where you were yeah. with your master teacher all day long trying to learn how to do what he does. And that's what it meant to apprentice under Jesus or to follow Jesus. So we lived, so that was then. Now we have this fascinating thing where Christian and disciple are no longer synonyms, where you can't be a disciple of Jesus without being a Christian, but you can be a Christian without being a disciple of <laughs> Jesus in modern vernacular. Right. So all that Christian really means uh, in kind of modern American verbiage is just someone that ascribes to the kind of bare bones of Christianity's doctrine about God and the Trinity and Christ and, you know, lives by a rough Judeo-Christian ethic in their worldview and possibly goes to church once in a while. That's yeah. all that word means to most people. In fact, to many people on the coasts now, if you're in California or New York, Christian is a political word. It's often code for like white conservative, which is certainly not what it means in the New Testament mm -hmm. or around the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this bizarre phenomenon that is very unique, Sadie, to our time, as you know, where the way the church has developed in American history, we're in this unique pocket of time where we have made it possible to become a Christian without becoming a disciple of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for all the talk about post-Christianity in America, which you feel very much if you're in a place like LA where I live now, about 68% of Americans still identify as Christians. In the parts of the world that I've grown up in California and Portland, that's just almost impossible to imagine. But there are parts of the country where it feels like that. But a number of independent surveys that attempt to measure whether or not people are actually following Jesus, which is tricky to measure, but they all estimate that about 4% of Americans are following Jesus. Wow. So 68% identify as Christians and something like 4% of Americans are following Jesus. Wow. And that disparity has created this kind of two-tier church where you have this huge number of people that identify as Christians, believe the gist of Christianity and a basic Judeo-Christian ethic, and may go to church every week or once a year or never or a couple times a year, but they are not 
apprenticing under Jesus every single day of their lives, following him, attempting to wow. deepen their surrender and obedience to him. They're often, whether they come from the right or the left, from a city like a- LA or a small town in Alabama, they're just more loyal to their socio-political tribe than they are to the way of Jesus, to their ideologies from the right or the left than they are to the teachings of Jesus, mm-hmm. to their vision of a this earthly kingdom than to the kingdom of God. And so much of the invitation, I think, you know, Dallas Willard, again, and I quote him in the book, has this beautiful line where he writes, the greatest issue facing the world today with all its heartbreaking needs is whether those who identify as Christians will become disciples, apprentices, Mm -hmm. practitioners of Jesus Christ. Wow. And, you know, if you think about all of the problems we're facing in the world today, from political polarization, to multiple wars, to the threat of nuclear war, to climate change, to the economy, like so many issues, most of them would almost disappear overnight if the several billion people around the world who self-identify as Christians began to actively apprentice under Jesus in every single day of their lives. Hmm. And so... I don't think it's an overstatement for Willard to say it's the greatest issue facing the world today for Christians to become disciples. Wow, man, that is that's so good. I wanted to read this quote because it's just right on what you're saying. And it is so good. When I read this, I thought, wow, like I felt personally convicted by this because of things I've said like, oh, you know, go into church and wish that you learn more, which is wishing that, you know, Mm -hmm. your pastor taught more, whatever it is, you know, um, of a great Mm -hmm. church um, family. But, you know, you just feel those feelings in church in different places. Um, But this was so good because you hear this language in the church all the time. But it said, here's why. If disciple is something that is done to you, a verb, Mm -hmm. then that puts the, um, I might say this word wrong. How do you say this? (laughs) The onus of responsibility, the is that the next line? of responsibility. Yes. <laughs> Way to go. I didn't know you're writing. Yeah. The onus of responsibility for your spiritual formation on someone else, like your pastor, your church, or a mentor. But a disciple is a noun. If it's someone you are and or and or not, then one can disciple you, but then no one can disciple you, but Rabbi Jesus himself. Mm. And I thought, oh my mm. gosh, that is so good because here we are <laughs> so often thinking, oh, we're not taught enough. If only the church taught more, if only the pastor taught more, if only the, we had a mentor, if only we had this, like we need to be discipled, mm-hmm. we need to be discipled. And I am guilty yep. of saying that very thing. So I'm, I'm with you for those listening to podcasts. If you've been feeling that way, I've said those things. I've felt that way. But when I read that, I felt so convicted in that, that a disciple is a noun. It's someone that you are or that you're not. And the only person who can truly disciple you and should really be uh, discipling you is the rabbi, is the teacher, is Jesus himself. And, you know, that was super convicting because recently just I felt, you know, having two kids, I've been, you're so tired. It's so crazy mm. working kids, mom I totally life. Know. Yes. And you're like, it's hard to get to church on Sunday. It's hard to sit and read the word. And I just feel like, oh, if, if only someone was teaching me, blah, blah. And I'm like, but then the second I get in my word, if I just sit for a minute, I mean, I learn so much. I feel so discipled. Mm-hmm. I feel so um, pastored, if you will, by just reading mm-hmm. the teachings of Jesus, by reading the letters to the church. I feel so encouraged and strengthened. And it, it just takes mm-hmm. a, an hour of sitting with him, sometimes less. I mean, just, but if you get it, if I get a whole hour, man, I feel so strengthened. And so I just feel like when I read that, I felt personally convicted and inspired and encouraged to go like, man, this is not just like a verb and some people are and some people aren't and those who do vocational ministry are and those who don't are not. This is a noun that we all are to be a disciple of Jesus. No one else, Jesus. So love that point in the book. Um, on on that note, I want you to speak into that. But with that, you know, there's um, an awesome thing whenever you're hosting podcasts for those who don't host podcasts or written books that are in that world, but the um, book company typically sends you questions that you can go off of. And I don't always Mm -hmm. choose those questions because I always like to, you know, 
really take in the book or get to know the person a little bit more, see if there's other things I could ask. But there was a question on there that I thought was so good and so spot on when they were, the person suggested this question and they were basically saying, look, the church, we we have like an overview of the Bible, but why are we not getting that spiritual maturity that we truly desire? And that was really the question. And I want to ask you that question with this note of like, do you think that we're not getting that spiritual maturity that we desire because we haven't realized that we don't need to just be discipled, but we are disciples of Jesus, because I think that those mm-hmm. things kind of go hand in hand. Okay, so here's the thing. Before having kids, I honestly liked going grocery shopping. It was just kind of nice. I didn't take my time, all the things. But after having kids, I'm like, okay, grocery shopping can be kind of a hassle, especially when I have a car seat and a toddler and all the things. I'm going down the aisle. So it is just so nice to get them delivered right to my door. I love getting my groceries to my doorstep. And Hungry Root is the easiest way to get fresh, high-quality groceries delivered right to me. No more wandering around the busy grocery store, hauling groceries with a toddler in a car seat. They are just right at my doorstep. All you have to do is take a short, fun quiz that will help Hungry Root get to know you and your taste. Like which kitchen appliances do you normally use for cooking or what's your favorite flavors, all the things. Hungry Root will keep your answers in mind while they build a cart full of groceries that they think you're going to love and you can take their suggestions or choose whatever you want. You get to choose from the best fresh produce, quality meat and seafood, pantry staples, healthy snacks, and so much more, including seasonal favorites. We love Hungry Root in our family I actually do like to take their suggestions because the first time we did it I let them totally pick for me and it was stuff that I never had tried before and Christian and I ended up loving it and so now I kind of pick my own things but I've gotten to try all kinds of new things with Hungry Root and I love it so much I think their healthy snacks is probably my favorite thing on there because it's stuff I couldn't even get at my local grocery stores so Hungry Root is just awesome all around it has you covered with thousands of easy ideas that actually put your groceries to good use instead of being forgotten in the back of the fridge and the best part is that everything you get from Hungry Root follows a simple standard. It has to taste good, be quick to make, and contain whole trusted ingredients. Sounds pretty legit to me. So spend less time shopping and more time enjoying delicious healthy foods that you'll love with Hungry Root. Right now, Hungry Root is offering my listeners 30% off your first delivery and free veggies for life. That is like no small thing, y'all. Free veggies for life. So just go to HungryRoot.com slash woe to get 30% off your first delivery and get your free veggies. That's HungryRoot.com slash woe. And don't forget to use our link so that they know that we sent you there. Oh, no, that's I love to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I named the book Practicing the Way was that's language from Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount and all through the Gospels. And you mentioned that line, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there are two different interpretations of uh, no one comes to the Father except through me. Um, There's two different interpretations of that first part about the way where some people think it means it's like a, a soteriological or theological statement saying that the only way to heaven when you die or to God is through faith in Jesus. And uh, other people think it means, no, there is a way, there is a very specific way to live that is based on the lifestyle and the teachings of Jesus himself. So we use that mm-hmm. same language later at the sermon in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, broad is the way, same exact word, that leads to destruction and many follow it and narrow is the way that leads to life. And again, some mm-hmm. people think that means only a few people are going to heaven when they die and everybody else is going to hell. Another way to read that is there are two different ways to live. There's the broad way, which is basically follow the crowd and do whatever you want. And it leads to destruction. Now you can imagine, and I think destruction means what it sounds like. It's a broad, wide sweeping word. It just means a life falling apart. And there's a narrow way that leads to life, which is the word used by Jesus for this extraordinary Hmm. type of life that we can have with him and the Father. And I think narrow there means there is a very specific way to live. There is a specific, clear way to live that's based on the life of Jesus himself. And if you follow that way, it will absolutely lead you to life. And so I love this concept. And all of that to say, back to your question, my essential conviction of this book and of my life and teaching is that the way of Jesus is exactly what it sounds like. It's a way of life. It's not just a set of ideas that we believe in our head 
about the Bible and theology and doctrine. It's not just a moral system of do's and don'ts and this is bad and this is good. It is both of those things, but it is so much more. It's an actual way of life together in community following Jesus and a way of life you cannot learn by listening to a podcast or reading a book or watching a YouTube video. Uh, you have to learn it with your body. So I chatted to this guy who used to do this thing called the Jesus Dojo. And I was like, bro, why do you call it? the? What are you talking about? Why do you call your, he did this little like Christian discipleship thing and he called it the Jesus Dojo. That's and I was funny. like, why do you call, why do you call, that's exactly what I thought. Why do you call this the Jesus Dojo? And he said, following Jesus is closer to learning karate than it is to learning history or chemistry or, you know, theoretical physics. But yet our churches often look more like college lecture halls than they do like dojos. Hmm. And there's only so much that you can learn by just having thoughts in your brain. The whole point of discipleship is to get those thoughts from your brain down into the muscle memory of your body so that hmm. you're actually becoming a person of love. And the problem with much of the kind of Western church is it was built because of kind of when it came to birth around the age of the Enlightenment and some other historical factors. So many people who are Christians in America and the West believe that as your knowledge of the Bible increases, your spiritual maturity will increase along with it. The problem is that's true to a point but you can only grow and mature so much by getting good ideas from the Bible and Christian theology into your head. Mm -hmm. That is an essential foundation, beginning point. You never really mature beyond it. I read scripture every single day. I will do so until I die. But you have my problem now is not that I don't know the Bible. That may have been my problem 20 years ago. My problem now is that there are habits of sin in my body that keep me from obeying the Bible. So yeah. now the challenge, not that I don't need to continue to study the Bible and learn more about scripture, but now the challenge is, all right, how do I get this into my muscle memory? You're a mom. You know what it's like when you're exhausted and your kid, it's not all love and feelings when your kid interrupts you or wakes up <laughs> in the middle of the night or spills milk on your dress right before you're going out to a thing. Yep. And that reaction, what just comes out of your body, C.S. Lewis once said that how we respond to interruptions is who we really are. Wow. You see in those moments where what comes out of us, is it a flash of anger or fear or selfishness or controlling behavior? Hmm. That says a lot about who we still actually are in our character. Mm -hmm. And so getting that healed, saved, formed, and transformed, that's the lifelong process of discipleship, of getting the truth of Scripture and the writings of the New Testament, the teachings of Jesus, into the muscle memory of our bodies. And mm -hmm. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said that will take, the word he used was practice. And mm -hmm. so that's just a central idea for me. It's great. It's so good. Gosh, I've, I knew I was going to learn a lot. I already am. Um, I've, I got a question. This is going to be okay. probably an interesting question um, because I am preparing to preach at Passion. Passion Conference is... You know, Amazing. coming up in the beginning of January. So excited go, about it. Yes. This might be coming out after Passion or before, but I think it it doesn't matter. I think that whatever oh, we you talk will do about such a great what a gift you will be. Thank you. I'm I'm very excited, but it's interesting because this year, so each year, speaking of passion, I've had um I felt like a very specific word that I had felt like the Lord gave it to me many months before worked on it for for months and felt super confident in it. this time I have not felt that way at all uh, I felt like <laughs> the Lord has not given me the words yet which I think in a lot of ways um, it has actually been a really good thing because I feel like it's requiring me to really lean in. And um, I think also I'm not worried about it because I've seen God come in time and time again, giving me the mm. words, just like he promised mm. Moses he would do and different people throughout the scripture. Mm -hmm. And you see him do all throughout the New Testament with the um, 
disciples and all of that. So I'm not worried about it, but what I have felt in the direction to share is interesting that we're talking about this because I feel like the Lord wants me to remind people of the story. Like, what is the story of Jesus? And which seems so simple because in, in one way I want to go, well, don't, don't most people know the story, right? But then recently, or who are going to be a passion, I should say. But then recently, as I've been talking to people who are friends and different things, and we just get to talking about the story and there's so much of the story they don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing yeah. that it's like the, the things that maybe they've heard or scriptures they might even recognize not understanding the context of that. Now, I say all this to say, I am an unschooled person. I have not been to seminary school. I have not, you know, gotten um, a degree in any of this. I don't even know if I could tell you, I haven't read the Bible from front to back in order. Like I haven't said, like, so part of me feels so unqualified for this. But then I'm thinking, aren't we all like that? I mean, Peter and them, they were known mm-hmm. as unschooled men who just yes. were filled with the spirit and went for it. So to but those, they had been with Jesus. Yeah. That's what it says. That's good. That's yes. That's so good. So for those who are like myself, which is everyone listening to this podcast, who probably everyone listening who aren't schooled, who don't know um, everything there is to know about theology and all of those different things. Like, if you were going to tell the story um, of Jesus, um, just going for it, do you think, um, well, I should say it like this. I'm, I'm forming my question as I'm even asking the question. So excuse me for the messiness of this podcast. But I, I think what stood out to me just then is that you said 20 years ago, that might've been my problem. And maybe a lot of us who are listening, most people 18 to 25 are going to passion. We might be in that 20 years ago moment of like, yes. maybe we don't know where do you start? How do you begin to know the story to even be able to tell the story? And how do you take that pressure off yourself to know all of it, to tell the good news of it? Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, the, the beauty of the story of Jesus is it's simple enough for a child to get the gist of it and complex enough for a triple (laughs) PhD to spend their entire life learning and still discovering new layers to it, you know? And uh, as you know, Sadie, we were born at an extraordinary time in human history where you don't have to be a wealthy, elite, intellectual male in order to go to an institution of higher learning to get access to theology and biblical theology and learning and truth. It's as far away from you as your iPhone is or Mm. your web browser. Yeah. And I think of, you know... My dear friend, Tim Mackey from the Bible Project. Have you had him on by any chance? No, but I listen like that is my teacher half the time. Before I preach sermons, I listen to the Bible Project. I make sure I got the overview of the story right. So that's so cool you said that. No, I mean, and he is a delight. So we spent many years together in Portland. I loved him. I actually had him as one of my professors in seminary before Bible Project ever started. And he was incredible, as you would imagine. Wow. And the gift of, I I have been through Bible college, Sadie. First off, that feeling of feeling underqualified never goes away. At least it certainly has not gone away for me. I don't feel smart enough. I certainly don't feel godly enough. I don't feel humble enough. I don't feel strong enough. I don't feel confident enough. I don't feel well-spoken enough. And that feeling you actually never want to lose. Jesus called it spiritual poverty. The first of Jesus' beatitudes was blessed are the poor in spirit, Um, the spiritually poor, those that have no spiritual wealth and power to offer, but just come, Lord have mercy is our anthem. (laughs) I cannot tell you how many times before I get up to speak, it's Lord have mercy or release a book, Lord have mercy or do a podcast, Lord have mercy. Mm -hmm. That feeling, you never want to lose sight of it because without that feeling, you will never grow and you will never become who God wants you to become. Wow. But so don't ever lose that feeling. Don't try to get rid of it through learning or education or prowess or experience because that will be the end of your ministry. But so good. uh, Wow. It's such an amazing time. Back to Bible Project. I went through Bible college and through seminary and through other forms of education. And I'm telling you, if all you do is start in episode one of the Bible Project's podcast 
and just listen through, you will know more, way more than I knew at the end of seminary because Tim and others are just geniuses on that thing. And it's free and it's available and you can do it. You can do it. Sadie, you can do it while you're folding laundry or driving your kids to school. Or whatever. I don't know what you do. Running, exercising, playing soccer. I don't know what you do. <laughs> playing but. soccer. I wish I did all those things. I just ha- can't I, do I, it while podcasting. To... But no, I do not mean to interrupt you. I'm just honestly like have to take this moment to say how crazy this is because whenever this is so crazy. Whenever the Lord I p- I felt like He put on my heart to tell the story, no joke. Follow up to that when I was talking to the God about how, God, I don't feel like I'm the one to do that. Like speaking of Ben Stewart, let Ben Stewart do that part. He knows so Mm -hmm. much more, you know, let someone else take that. I literally felt the Lord give me direction to start at the first video of the Bible project. So I, no way. I am not kidding. I went to the first video of the Bible project and started (laughs) it. And every day I have been feeling like I got to get back on that so I can finish that before passion. I have 29 days from the moment we're talking about right now. And I'm not kidding. I've only done the one and I've been feeling the Lord kind of prompt me to like, hey, don't forget, Mm -hmm. do that, do that. And here I am saying, I don't really know why I'm asking you this question. This is kind of a messy question. This is probably even going to be after passion. And then you tell me the very thing the Lord already told me to do. And it's so specific. That's beautiful. That is absolutely beautiful. I love (laughs) it. And there are other great resources out there, too. That's just... That one is just so dang good and pleasant and enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that was that was a cool moment. Go ahead. That is a cool moment. Let's celebrate that moment with Jesus. Dang, that's awesome. Almost like you and I have the same spirit of Jesus inside our bodies. (laughs) It's crazy. That is almost like he's full of love and involved in our day to day lives and intermingling his thoughts with our thoughts and his desires with our desires to direct us into goodness and wisdom and love. Almost. Wow. Almost like Almost. that. Almost. Wow. <laughs> My gosh. This is so good. I am, um, you know, for those listening who have not had a moment like this or maybe you know, you haven't been walking with Jesus. I know a lot of people who listen to this podcast actually aren't even Christians. They're just intrigued by the things that we're saying. Um, I, I have to say, am I surprised by this? In some ways, it's always shocking whenever God does things like this because it's so cool. But also, um, things like this do happen because you are united yeah. by one spirit and God is a good father and father of me and you. And uh, in a lot of ways, when you pray things to him, he's answering your prayers to other people. And 11 first John, it says, you know, no one's ever seen God, but we see God through the way that we love one another. Like we get to see mm. who God is, the evidence that God yes. really is there by the way that we speak to one another and God prompts us. And it's like, when you talk to God personally, about things so specifically like I was talking to God about that that I didn't feel you know qualified to do this and how God teach me how I'm gonna learn in 30 days how to preach this message of passion and God says go watch the Bible project from the beginning and then here I am talking to you which we never even had a conversation really before besides backstage at if gathering different things and you say the very thing what that does is it makes me go wow God like you you mm. did say that you really yes. are for this you real really are and in this real and involved and it raises my faith and so this is such yep. a cool moment on the podcast for those listening in of just a moment to kind of raise your faith and talk to God about those personal things and you will see him in your personal life and and even people that aren't Christians without veering into weird theological territory because I think there, I'm not a universalist. I think there is a, a clear distinction between those who have the Holy Spirit in them and those who don't. But I think God is omnipresent and his overwhelming in compassion and love toward all. And so I think all sorts of people are having little weird experiences like this who aren't Christians at all or have yet to follow Jesus. It's where I think like living in LA now, you hear a lot of people talk about the universe. The universe, yeah. And it's a whole, I always just, it takes me a lot, it takes self-discipline not to make fun of it because I think it's kind of silly. 
But, and people talk about the universe as it's like a proper noun, as if the universe is a person, like the universe has my back or the universe was speaking to me or the universe was at work in these circumstances. And I'm like, okay, this is not like the thir third law of thermodynamics is like loving you through this coincidence. I think that's people trying to understand a God who is gently present to people and inviting them into relationship with themselves through Jesus. Yeah. And so I, I think even for some of you listening, you might not even be a Christian. You might just be wondering at the coincidences in your life. And I just want to say to you, they are not the universe. The universe <laughs> is, is not a personal being. They are the Trinity. They are the, the God of love coming toward you and gently inviting you into relationship with himself because he loves you and wants to bless you and fill your life with his presence and his goodness. But I do think these experiences in life are probably far more common than most of us realize. But again, That's like so you true. said, we're just going so fast. We don't have time to behold it, mm -hmm. to take it all in. Yeah. And we miss it a lot of the time. So true. So cool. So cool. Whenever you, you can't miss it. Like in that moment, I was like, cause it did mm -hmm. feel so specific that the Lord prompted me to do that. And, um, I've almost been, ignoring it i've been like okay i'll start this but that's a that's a lot of videos to watch in a short amount of time but now i cannot <laughs> wait to go watch those videos i'm like i will be up late tonight i will be up early no, tomorrow because i'm so excited it. Like, awesome. it makes you like so excited so yes. that's so cool oh, um that's great gosh okay let's see it um i probably only have time for like one more question so i'm just looking at some of the things i jotted down um I think this is really cool just as an invitation into this. So like we're mentioning people who are listening to this who might just be um, intrigued by this and not ever step foot into what it would be to be a disciple of Jesus, what it would look like to really be a follower of him. I love how you were telling the story about whenever Jesus shows up to Peter and he says, like, drop your net, I'll make you a fisher, a man. And um, I love that story. I love Peter. So any story with Peter in it, I, I just have mm -hmm. always really gravitated tours because I feel like I can relate a lot to some of the things that he struggled with, the different ways that he acted mm. and responded to things. And so yes. I just kind of like take Such note Such a of relatable those. person. Yes. So relatable. Yes. Um, and I love how you said um, before they even believed in Jesus, Jesus believed in them, which that was such a profound thing to even read because I think a lot of times we just feel like man, I wish I could be better so that God would be proud of me or that, you know, he would love me or I couldn't be a part of that because I'm not good enough. And of course, if you really know the character of God, you know, that's not true, but sometimes it's still hard to believe, you know? Um, and so to see that, that these men were fishermen, like they literally were fishermen. They weren't mm -hmm. back to the whole school thing, back to the whole, you know, the best of the best. Yes. And Jesus believed in them. So can you talk a little bit about that revelation for yourself and uh, sharing that in this book? And for those who are listening, who might just feel like, man, I can't even fathom the fact that God would believe in me to actually become a follower of him. Mm. Oh yeah. I'm so glad you said that. You know, I almost cut that out of the book. Every single round of editing I went through, which you know about, it, yeah. it was like, it was on the chopping block and it kept almost getting cut out just because it could be interpreting kind of a self-helpy way. Like God believes in you. And mm -hmm. I, that's just not my shtick. Yeah. Um, but I do think so many people live under this cloud of shame that Jesus is inviting us out of. And the backstory to that statement which is actually a quote from uh, the Count of Monte Cristo, the movie, which I love, but um, where, you know, he's in prison and where Dante says to the old Catholic priest, I don't believe in God. And the priest said that that's okay. God believes in you. And, hmm. um, but in context, I'm talking about discipleship in the first century, which was actually a part of their educational system, kind of like our high school, college, mm -hmm. grad school, PhD mm -hmm. kind of system. And discipleship was like our equivalent of a PhD or a postdoctorate fellowship. It was like the top, 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 the highest level of education that only the best of the best of the best could get into. It'd be like, hmm. you know, Sadie, you getting invited to do a postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard or something <laughs> like that. Wow. That's what it was like to become a disciple of a rabbi. And so, um, and you couldn't apply for it. You had to be invited in by a rabbi. They had to choose wow. you. 
you would never choose them. And it was, again, only for the best of the best of the best. Most kids were all sent home by 12 or 13 to just run the family farm or the family business. Some, like the best of the best, would go on to a second level of education called the House of Learning, where they would study until about 16 or 17 years old. And then they would all go home and, again, run the family business, run the farm, become a merchant. It was only like the 0.01% that became a disciple of a rabbi, which is why it's shocking when Jesus says, if anyone would become my disciple, take up their cross and deny themselves and follow me. That would be like the president of Harvard saying, if anyone would like a free ride scholarship to get your PhD, just DM me or shoot me an email. You're in. It's like, um, nobody said that it's unheard of, which is how you make sense of that story in Mark one about Peter where Peter and his brother Andrew are fishing and they're running a kind of small business. They probably weren't poor. They're probably like middle-class dudes running a fishing business in the Galilee. And they're one day running their business fishing and Jesus is walking on the beach and he says, you know, come follow me. And they literally, the text says they dropped their nets. They walked out on their family business and literally just started walking behind Jesus, left everything, left their career. I was like, can you imagine just like walking out of your job, like rent, no plan, no, like in a year, you know, Jesus invites you to apply for this. Like Jesus just walks into your office one day or your job site. And it's like, Hey, Sadie, you want to, you want to apprentice under me and just drop everything. What would make somebody do that? And it was just, this was the chance of a lifetime. So I, this is a clumsy analogy, but I, uh, I use this analogy in the book where it's like, imagine you never went to college, you dropped out of high school, but you always wanted to become a professor. That was your dream was to become a professor. But for whatever reason, your family or life, or you got pregnant or something happened, or you needed to care for your, for whatever reason, you dropped out of high school and you're working some hourly job at a f- in food service and you hate it. Imagine if like a world famous professor is on his international book tour and pulls in and stops by to get some lunch, walks in, takes a liking to you at the counter and says, hey, um, I think that you could do what I do. I think you could become an even better professor than me. And if you come with me right now, I'll give you a full ride scholarship to Harvard. You can live in my house. I'll teach you everything I know. You can personally mentor under me and I'll make sure that you, you know, you are a launched into the world to do this thing, but you have to leave right now. I mean, any thinking person would just throw their apron on the floor and storm out the door with Jesus. That's not even a virtue. That's just like basic math. Hmm. And that's, that's what it's like to receive this invitation to follow Jesus. It's like the, wow. the parable that Jesus told about the person that finds treasure buried in a field and sells everything they have in order to go and get the treasure. That's not virtue. That's just anybody good at math. You know, if you had to sell everything you had to buy a piece of property, but that property had $10 billion buried in it in gold, you would gladly sell everything mm. you own down to your wedding ring and your socks <laughs> in order to get that because you'd be getting so much more than you had to give up. And that's what following Jesus is like. It will cost you everything and you will get more than you could fathomly ever imagine or value. But the invitation of Jesus is he believes that all of us can apprentice under him into becoming Mm. people of love. And we want to believe in Jesus, but he also, in that sense, believes in us. It's great. That's so good. So encouraging and hope filled. And I, I love that you kept it in the book because um, it, it was when I read it the first time, I was like, man, that is so cool. And then I'm like, man, that's so that's so deep. I mean, especially when I think about all the insecurities that I've had in my life to know that like, mm. Yes. God knew those. Like he he knows yes. that about me before he invited me into this story, you know, mm-hmm. to to be his disciple and to learn and to do the things that I'm doing and tell people about him as inadequate and unworthy as I feel. It's not it's not about me, it's about him, you know? And so I just I love that. This is so good. This is so rich. I'm so excited for people to listen to this podcast and hear all of this incredible advice. If you have listened to this and you're so encouraged as I'm sure all of you are um, doesn't have to stop here there's an entire book I didn't even get to half of the things that I had jotted down to write about so go check out um, John Mark Comer's new book Practicing the Way he has several other resources um, what's the best place to find all the things 
Yeah, you can go to practicingtheway.org. So the book is named after a nonprofit that I recently started that makes all makes a course and all sorts of practices and resources that you can do for discipleship in community. Get a couple of your friends together, your small group, and learn about Sabbath or spiritual formation or discipleship or solitude or prayer. So that it's and it's all free at practicingtheway.org. Um, it's incredible. Same name as the book. Easy to remember. Easy to remember. Y'all go check it out. Um, the Team LO actually did a series study um, of his, and it was so helpful for our team and just really great. So go check out all the stuff. Uh, thank you so much, John Mark, for all your advice and living the life you live and leading the way you lead. Super grateful over oh, here in Louisiana you, for all Sadie. of it. Mm, same to you. Thank you for being who you are and inviting me on. <laughs> <laughs>